This is actually a very important topic. Women's health, women's health, particularly with heart disease. So um, I can think of a lot of good stories, but more importantly, um, we're going to have a really interesting evening tonight. And uh, with us is uh, Rachel, uh, who is now uh, a medical student. I remember Rachel when she first started undergraduate. She's really uh, a remarkable lady and the whole crew that's working with her, all wonderful young people who really worked hard on this uh, this presentation. So I'm really excited to uh, hear what, uh, what the team has to say. So I'll just be quiet for a little bit and uh, let uh, Rachel start off with. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel. Uh, thanks Dr. Kearney for the introduction. I'm a second year medical student at McMaster. And like the slide says, today we're going to be talking about women's health and heart disease and how um, different it could look in the woman population. And tonight with me we have Aditi. She's an undergraduate student and she worked very hard with me on these slides and the presentation. So we'll just be flipping back and forth. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, and Stuart, you can monitor the chat for that as well. But we'll just get on started. Uh, so some of the things that we're going to be talking about today is a brief overview of what heart disease is, just so everyone's on the same page. And then what are some unique risk factors that are present in women um, and how heart disease might look differently in them. There's some research that's evolving in the field of women and heart disease. There's still a lot more that we can do. Um, but we'll talk about some of the interesting research that's come in the most recent years. And what can we do about women and the cardiovascular risk? And um, what are some unique ways that we can help lower that? All right, so how are women different from men? I love that. Men, I remember the book there, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I don't know if I ever read the book. I just remember the title. Has anybody read the book at all? No? Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah, I haven't read the I've, I think I've read snippets of books and read. Uh, I've seen quotes from that. But I think just from the beginning of time, there's been this like fundamental notion that women are so different from men in many different ways, like physically, emotionally, socially, personality-wise, type A, type B, left brain, right brain. There's a lot of different theories out there. Um, and based on whether or not you believe those are true, I think we can all agree that men and women have very different life experiences. Um, women, we have a motherly role, whereas men take the role of the father. And that's not necessarily um, anything different or worse or better, but I think it's important to note that women have played a lot of different roles uh, throughout life in a lot of different aspects of life, um, and they might have less time to themselves because of that. And sometimes, um, traditionally, the stereotypes are women can have different preferences or what they want to do in terms of activities, so that might look in the way of what they choose to do for exercise and their hobbies, um, as well as pregnancy. That's a very unique um, life experience for women, and that actually puts a lot of different strain and stress and puts your body through a lot of different things that can affect multiple different systems. And these are all some of the things that we're going to be touching on, on today in today's presentation. So one thing get to remember is that us guys who get married gain life, women who get married lose life. So we'll, we'll explore that and uh, some of the differences and similarities between heart disease in both uh, men and women. Go ahead there, Rachel. All right, so we're going to start by um, kind of distilling down what you may have heard about heart disease in women. So you may have heard that heart disease isn't as common in women. It's more of a men's disease. Um, you may have heard that Instead of heart disease, breast cancer is the most important issue for Canadian women. Um, some people may have heard that women are actually at a decreased risk of heart disease compared to men. Um, some people may believe that women are better at making healthy lifestyle choices for themselves because we're just more health conscious. Um, and some people may have heard the fact that heart disease in women looks different than heart disease in men. So we're going to go through right now and see which one of these are myths and which ones are facts. So the first statement, heart disease isn't as common in women. This is a myth. In fact, in North America, uh, one in three women live with heart disease. And every 20 minutes in Canada, a woman dies from heart disease. So heart disease is, in fact, very, very serious and is super common in women. So next one, breast cancer is the most important issue for Canadian women. I think there's this huge notion about breast cancer being um, such a prevalent disease for women. There's so much media coverage of breast cancer. A lot of people get regular checkups for breast cancer, but not a lot of people pay attention to um, cardiovascular health. But heart disease is actually the number one cause of death for women in Canada. It outwins breast cancer for just by five times as of 2018. You can see 
2011 by Statistics Canada, only less than 5,000 women died of breast cancer in Canada, whereas 35,000 women, almost 35,000 died of heart disease and stroke. And heart disease and stroke actually beat out every single type of cancer all put together. So um, heart disease is just as important, if not more important, than cancer prevention and um, following up there. It, it's kind of interesting is that since I started practice over 30 years ago, mortality from heart disease has been cut by... Oh, about 50 to 80 percent. So we have better therapy. Well, mortality from cancer has not come down to the same degree. And what happened is that heart disease, and here's a number saying that heart disease is number one killer. There's actually data right now is that uh, heart disease is becoming the number two killer in, in Canada for both males and females because uh, we're making better inroads on preventing and treating the heart disease. And so uh, cancer in some series are out, outpacing um, heart disease. So I'm pleased that to say that my disease, heart disease, is maybe the number two killer. Cancer may be number one. But you can see that uh, what we're all thinking is that, you know, breast cancer is, is a leading cause of concern for women. It is a big concern. Up to one in 12 women will develop uh, breast cancer in their lifetime. But heart disease will kill a lot more women uh, compared to breast cancer. Here this says five times. So it's really important to uh, not ignore breast cancer, but Unfortunately, recognizing and treating heart disease in women is, is, is can be a challenge. What more can you tell us, Rachel? All right, so the next fact was that women are at a decreased risk of heart disease than men. This is something that I've heard throughout the years as well. People think that heart disease tends to be a male disease. And this is a myth, kind of. And I say that because before menopause, the naturally higher estrogen levels that we have in our body may be protective for women when it comes to heart disease. But then during menopause and after menopause, the risk of heart disease it tends to be the same in both men and women. So this protective effect doesn't um, last for the rest of your life. And some risk factors in women actually put them in a higher risk of heart disease after menopause compared to men and uh, I added this note because of we talked about the natural high estrogen may be protective um, that is in the pre-menopausal period but that's not to say that we're supporting the addition of um, hormonal replacement therapies post-menopause because the addition of like synthetic hormone replacement therapy post-menopause there's no evidence to suggest that that is protective rather it can be more harmful and increase the risk of clots and strokes in fact there's very good data that giving estrogens and progesterones 10 years after the menopause increases breast cancer, increases clots, increases size of stroke, increases heart attacks. Um, so it's kind of interesting is that uh, when I started my practice as a cardiologist, I used to prescribe hormone replacement therapy in the hope that it prevented heart attacks. I was wrong, and so was the research. So we'll explore that a little bit more right now is that, you know, Estrogens before menopause seem to be protect against heart disease, but after menopause, when you start to lose those estrogen receptors, they're detrimental because they cause clotting abnormalities. But we'll explore that a little bit more. So, lots to learn, lots of new myths and new realities. All right, and then the next one, another preconceived notion some people might have are that women are better at making healthy lifestyle choices for themselves because they're just better at taking care of people. Um, but that appears to be a myth according to the literature. So traditionally, like we mentioned, women tend to care for others before themselves. We just have so many other things to keep um, our eyes on and our ears on, like cooking, housekeeping, child care. And this added responsibility also adds to more stress, which is another risk factor for heart disease that we'll talk about in the, um, in the presentation. And there's um, some research given by the Heart and Stroke Foundation that women are actually 50% less likely than men to participate in cardiac rehabilitation after they had a cardiac event. So that just increases their risk of decreased recovery and um, increased recurrence of cardiac events later on. That's actually important. Uh, we started off in saying that uh, men who get married have protection from heart disease, and that's because of their spouses being uh, looking after them and being more involved. So when Traditionally, when a, a, a male patient comes to the office, it's more likely to have their spouse coming with them. But the other way around is when the spouse has a heart attack, it's less likely to have the male uh, companion coming in. So uh, we need to change that. And uh, that's something that uh, uh, the newer generation is changing. And it's something that I really encourage is that once the pandemic is over with, it's always good to bring your best supporters, your best allies, uh, 
for you for your, your doctor's visits. Um, and the same thing is working on prevention together just triples the benefit for both parties. So my advice is that when one member of the family has heart disease, the whole family has heart disease at risk, we all learn to work into that better. So, uh, so a plea for everybody is to really support those that are heart disease, both males and females. But us guys have not traditionally done a good enough job of protecting uh, our, our spouses from heart disease. I think historically, um, in the past, that, that uh, uh, the, the roles are shifting. It's more shared responsibility. So uh, I hope we do a better job in the future. All right, and then the last um, factor myth that we want to bust is heart disease and women look different from heart disease in men, and this is in fact true. So heart disease in women can look different on both a symptoms level and a microvascular, like a vascular level, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. And this report from the Heart and Stroke Foundation that looked at heart disease in women, it showed that early signs of heart attack were missing 78% of women. Uh, and there's a quote from a heart attack um, survivor who's a middle-aged female, and the quote says, In my mind, the stereotypical heart attack was an old guy clutching his chest on a golf course. And women need to know that they can have a heart attack yet continue to walk, talk, and work because that was her experience. And we have heard countless stories from patients over the time where women might feel dizziness, they might feel uh, signs of like, it feels like indigestion or back pain. Or very non-specific symptoms that's not necessarily the clutching the chest on the left side and falling over. Uh, and we kind of tend to present more complicatedly in a lot of different aspects of life. And <laughs> heart disease is also just one of those. <laughs> so I got a little chuckle out of all of us. So w one of the things is the classic presentation is this, it's not a pain doctor, it's a weight, it's a heaviness. Um, I feel sweaty. Uh, uh, and it tends to come on with exertion. So classic angina is that a heaviness or weight on the chest that tends to occur with activity. So uh, men tend to present more with classic angina. Women may present differently, but if you have a discomfort or you're feeling unwell, you're short of breath, having chest pain that's not explained by being overworked, exercise need to get that investigated. So to me, if, if you think you're having a heart attack, you call 911, chew a baby aspirin. I repeat that. If you think you're having a heart attack, you call 911 and chew a baby aspirin if you have that available to you. Um, and uh, now we all have all aches and pains. doesn't mean your ache and pain needs to go to the hospital, but these are some things you need to think about. So I, what worries me is something coming on with exertion, uh, something that's persistent that won't go away. I'm feeling sweaty. Um, I don't feel right, um, it may be a heart attack and it's best to have that checked if you're in an age group that has heart disease. So it means you're a little bit older, you have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you know, I'll lose the weight next year, uh, people say, so be, be attentive to those facts. And again, women will present, will, will, they'll come, come in with more, more difficult to diagnose at times. All right, now, now we're just going to move on to providing an overview of heart disease and different types of heart disease that we should keep an eye on for women. So there's four kind of main types that we want to talk about tonight. Uh, the first one is atherosclerotic disease. So this is the main type of disease that people might think of when they think of heart disease, the fatty plaque buildup in your blood vessels causing a clot and then blocks off blood supply to your heart. Um, and that can either be due to plaque erosion or fissure or plaque rupture. And then another type of major like large vessel disease predominantly seen in women is called spontaneous coronary artery dissection or SCAD. And we'll explain a little bit more about what that is and what that looks like later on. But then there's also the subset of smaller vessel or less obstructive disease like micro vessel disease and coronary artery basal spasm um, that affects the smaller vessels of your heart more and we'll explain all of this later on but I just want you to kind of keep these in your mind um, and picture that while we explain it um, just in a little bit. So on that far left, if you go go back one slide there, uh, if you look on the far left, there's astrosclerotic plaque. So this is what the classic plaque looks like. It's a buildup of cholesterol. We have lots of videos on that. and that's presents in both males and females, but it presents to a higher degree in, in, in males. And the, these entity of spontaneous dissections was basically discovered around women just after childbirths and things of that nature. And then we talk about these small vessels and microcirculation. These are new things that we're just learning about 
and, and we have some new information to share with you. So, and women have more of these diseases on the, uh, the, the three other panels. So, um, so that's why it's, uh, it's harder to make the diagnosis, and we're learning how to do that better right now. So very exciting information. So to me, um, what appears is that you can have traditional block of large vessels, or there might be some other things, so the microcirculation, that make the smaller highways or, or just a, uh, an erosion of the vessel and it dissects. So these are, these are really new information, and then we're actually going to present information as, as new as the American Heart Association meeting uh, last November of uh, 2020. So you're, you're going to be cutting edge. You're going to know more than most family doctors and many specialists at the end of this discussion. All right, so let me look at these four diseases. You can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, you can kind of group them into obstructive versus non-obstructive with the atherosclerotic plaque buildup and the spontaneous coronary artery dissection being classified as obstructive, and then the vasospasms and the microvessel disease as a non-obstructive. And how do we go about diagnosing these or imaging these? Um, you can move on, Stuart. So what, is it, what do we call obstructive? Well, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so if you look, if you look at the next slide... <laughs> It means that we're actually obstructing the artery wall and blocking off blood supply. And by um, this type of obstruction, we're kind of classifying large vessel obstruction. So the three major arteries that are bringing blood supply to your heart. I guess there's a few more major ones that could be obstructed as well. But if you're looking here at the primary like, atherosclerotic disease, we have this fatty deposition of plaque that builds up over time just from sheer wear and stress. And then the risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, poor diet, not taking your medications. It gradually builds up the plaque and eventually can build to the point where it's completely blocking off the blood supply to your heart. And traditionally, this is diagnosed with an angiogram where they inject dye into your vessels um, and try to image those major arteries around your heart. And that's what you're seeing on the right side of the screen there. And uh, if you have any blockage to any of the major arteries, it'll show through that image. Um, there'll be like narrowing at that portion and then that's kind of having no where to put the stent or um, where to pursue surgery if you need it. So historically uh, we don't get chest pains called angina until there's blockage of the major artery over 50 to 70 percent. So if you have a blockage that is 40 percent blocked, that's not going to cause you any symptoms. It doesn't cause angina pains, that, that funny pain when you walk or exert yourself. It's only after the artery is blocked between 50 to 70 percent that you start to diagnose, or you can. That's when you start to get exertional discomfort in your chest pain. So that's why this we call obstructive means blocked arteries. Most definitions are over 50 percent blocked because less than 50 percent blocked, it, it can be blocked, but you won't cause any symptoms unless it ruptures and you have a heart attack. So that's how that number got to place. So. Um, so, uh, so obstruction means that there's blockage greater than 50%, and obstructive means you can still have disease, but not enough to cause chest pains with activity. And what we're finding with a lot of women is that um, they might have chest pain and there might be a high risk of having a cardiac event, but their angiogram looks normal, so we're not really sure what to do with that subset, and there's a couple other imaging modalities that we can use to help supplement that. So if you go to the next slide... Uh, this is called optical coherence tomography. Um, it's normally used for the eyes and macular degeneration, but it's been recently been used more for the heart. And what this does is during the angiogram, they also put like a probe with the light, and it can actually help to illuminate the vessel wall to show more detail. Because if you look at the angiogram, it kind of just gives you like a surface level, whereas this is looking more at the vessel wall. And since women, we don't really have that major obstructive disease. That's less obvious on a, or that's as obvious on an angiogram. This can help to show more of the minute details that could be contributing to symptoms and increased risk. Um, so if you look on the right side, there's arrows pointing on panel A. So that's an angiogram, and that is showing um, uh, the abnormalities that you could see on an OC on the coherence tomography on the panels B, C, and D. And on the left side, that's what a normal one should look like, very smooth. So in A, on the angiogram, it's not super, super, super obvious, and probably to an interventional cardiologist, it's more obvious to them than me, um, that there might be abnormalities, but there's a lot more minute details and infiltration of inflammatory cells that can be picked up on the coherence tomography. And some of these abnormalities have been correlated to adverse cardiac events in women, and we'll show that research later on in the presentation. 
So it's actually very important to understand is that a traditional angiogram, you put a jet dye into the vessels, and look at that, that blackness. That should be with the circulation going into that. So the angiogram looks at how much blood is getting through the vessel. It doesn't really look at the vessel wall well, and that's why this new technology, this magic medicine here where you're using lasers, lights, CT scan imaging, more different modalities, is that you put a special probe that you have a more detailed look at this. This is not available for clinical practice at, at this stage on a regular basis. This is, these are research protocols that are telling us is that the angiogram can look good, but the vessels are still deeply injured. And what happens to males is that they have more severe blockages, where women have more diffuse, smaller blockages, harder to appreciate, and you need new technology. And this is actually emerging right now. So this is really... Um, cutting edge technology, you can't have this done on a regular basis. This is part of a uh, research protocol. I think in the future this will, will come to, uh, to, to, to practice uh, in certain circumstances. So let's explore this a little bit more. But seeing that is that, you know, it's a deeper look at the vessels. Another way, um, another option that we actually have for imaging heart disease Tees. And there's kind of two main types that I think are used um, in the role of CT in heart disease. So there's a coronary artery calcium scan where you actually just do a CT of the chest. Um, and then there's CT angiography where they take CT scans during the angiogram where they put the, where they're looking inside the actual vessels. Um, so you can look this coronary artery calcium scan that's on the top panel on the right, whereas the CT angiography is on the bottom panel. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Kearney, there's not also a really clear indication of the role of cardiac CTs at this time as well. Uh, they do, I think, provide clear images and angiograms at times and can be beneficial in that way. But there's also the risk of radiation with CTs. So if you look at the text, a calcium scan has a radiation of around 10 to 20 chest x-rays or 2 mammograms, whereas a CT angiogram, uh, which provides clear images in an angiogram can provide radiation of up to 150 chest x-rays. So it's kind of weighing the pros and risks of um, getting clearer, better images and potentially picking up on disease that wouldn't have been picked up on an angiogram versus the risk of radiation. So this is actually emerging technology. So in the States, it's very popular to get a, a calcium score. So the, the, the belief is that Calcium means that there's injury to the vessel, and that we think is that about 80% to 70% of plaque starts off with some calcium in there. That means that there's been some attack to the vessel walls, and it injures itself and forms calcium. So ideally, you want a calcium score less than zero. As you get older, um, you start to develop calcium in multiple places, but a calcium score over 100 in a young person is, uh, is a worrisome sign. As you get older, you can see the calcium score on this right is 1,200. That means there's lots of disease in that vessel. Uh, it's quick and relatively easy to do. Not available in Canada at this stage on a regular basis. It is a lot of radiation. One of the things is that women, because of the breast, those are, those are cells that are more prone to breast cancer, and radiation can damage them. So we don't want to do too many CTs at this point in time. We made the mistake in the past about thyroid cancer where we used to do a lot of thyroid uh, uh, testing and we, we gave people too much radiation. So right now, um, I think you have to be very selective who gets these sorts of things. And if you now do a, a, a CT or, or a CAT scan with doing an angiogram, you're getting, uh, uh, you're getting dye. Uh, you're, which can be also damaging in some circumstances to the kidneys, for instance, but you're also getting a bigger dose of radiation. But this gives you a more deeper level of understanding the vessel wall right now. So we're learning a lot. In, in, some, in some circumstances, we might do a CT coronary angiogram, uh, some, a, a CAT scan. The stress test is still the workhorse for uh, coronary artery disease. Remember, you need blocked arteries over 70% to 50% blocked in multiple arteries before a stress test becomes positive. So we have newer modalities, and because what we're going to learn soon is that women have more diffuse, non-severe disease, this may be a better modality if properly used. Next slide, please. 
And the last imaging technique that we wanted to mention is cardiac MRI. And again, there's not really a role for this right now in terms of primary investigation of chest pain or cardiac disease. Um, but there is a pro that there's less radiation and kind of is that it's quite expensive for the government. But what we kind of know about cardiac MRIs and MRIs in general is better at imaging soft tissue and inflammation. And we'll talk about um, how cardiac MRI has been shown in experimental purposes to be able to pick up on disease that was missed during angiogram and CT as well. So this is also evolving technology, but all kind of just leading to this point that uh, right now what we have so far for trying to investigate heart um, disease in women is not really good at picking it up in a lot of the cases, especially if they have this milder version or, or diffuse, non-specific version of it, that's still very harmful to their health. And there's different imaging modalities that may be better at picking it up. Um, and there's been shown that even women with normal angiograms can have abnormal other cardiac, other like cardiac, in, um, cardiac results and other imaging. But it's just not really being used yet. So we need to be really proactive when it comes to promoting cardiac health um, and disease prevention in women because it's just just because you have a normal cardiac test right now doesn't necessarily mean your heart vessels and your heart muscle is healthy. So one of the things that we can spend a lot of time diagnosing, I would I would encourage both men and women to spend more time preventing their heart disease. Now to get an MR study, to get a CAT scan, waiting times are long. It could be months to over a year in many circumstances to get these tests done. Uh, obviously people prioritize and there's lots of priorities for doing MRs and CAT scans. We have to use this technology wisely. We also have to learn too as well. So we're going to learn a lot more where they fit in. Um, and uh, so one of the things I've learned is that we spent a lot of time imaging, making a diagnosis. I encourage people to spend less time making the diagnosis and, and spending more time in prevention because that's where, uh, where you'll get the most gain. Remember that the vast majority of heart attacks come from a low-risk population. I'll repeat that. The vast majority of heart attacks will come from people with a little bit of cholesterol, a little bit of blood pressure, a little bit of weight to lose, a uh, little bit of stress, a little bit of everything. All these risk factors multiply. So uh, listen to experts who can help you prevent a heart attack. Heart disease or 80% of heart attacks in both males and females is preventable. I'll repeat that. 80% of heart attacks and strokes are preventable. So listen to the people about prevention. Spend less time diagnosing and diagnose at the right time, but prevention is key to success. Next slide. Ooh, what's this? So this is spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or SCAD. It's another one of the obstructive um, heart diseases that we mentioned before. And this is predominantly seen in the woman population. I think 80 to 90% of cases of SCAD are in the females. And it can account for almost 25% of heart attacks seen in women. So basically what SCAD is, it's an obstruction, but not from a lipid blockage or like a plaque buildup like we've seen in atherosclerotic disease, but actually from a tear in the blood vessel wall. Um, there's a video on the right, so if you could turn on your sound so that people can see too. It's from the Mayo Clinic and they actually show a video of how it, everything progresses because they do a better job at explaining it than I do. A tear develops on the inside of a coronary artery, allowing blood to create a split between two layers of the wall. This may result in a loose flap of tissue on the inside of the artery. Sometimes the split remains small, but the blood in between the layers can clot. This clot, called an intramural hematoma, may cause the normal artery channel to become narrow, blocking blood flow to the heart. Hmm. So if you go back to uh, STAD, and so, um, this is most appreciated. It, uh, it's more common to, during the, the during, during, during childbirth around that period of time, so it's easier to, to recognize. It's hard to recognize in other circumstances, and uh, and its treatment is different because if we put a stent the traditional way, we can actually make this dissection a lot worse. So it needs to be recognized. And I think when I first started my training, I I never heard of this thing called SCAD. Now it's becoming. I wouldn't say overly common. I think we can miss this diagnosis, but it's more recognized. So this will be more likely to be in a younger woman who has this new chest discomfort that's not going away, that's new, it could be, it's a, it actually presents as a heart attack, usually chest pain syndrome, that's a classic presentation. So uh, 
Uh, very interesting is, you know, but it means the artery is injured in some way. It doesn't, we don't believe it happens in a normal artery. The artery has to have some disease. And again, the disease is not as diffuse as a traditional blocked artery. Uh, it's an injured artery. So now we're going to talk about the non-obstructive causes of coronary artery disease. So on the left side, we have coronary artery vasospasm. And what that is, is like a tightening of the muscles that line your vessel wall. Uh, that causes a, like an intermittent blockage of blood flow, reduced blood flow to the heart. So if this is happening to the vessels of your coronary arteries, and you can imagine that this is reducing blood flow to your heart intermittently. It's not really the same as um, SCAD or atherosclerotic disease where the blockage is always there because it tends to kind of come and go. I think the main triggers for vasospasm um, in some women can be cigarette smoking as well as intense emotional stress. But what can happen is if the basal spasm lasts long enough, it can actually decrease blood flow enough to cause damage to the heart muscle, which is when it becomes an issue and can cause cardiac damage. Uh, and then on the right side, we have microvessel dysfunction. So uh, while men tend to get large vessel disease with blockages in their large arteries, women tend to get this more diffuse microvessel microvessel blockage where it's in all these tiny, tiny blood vessels that branch off of the large ones. And if it happens in enough vessels and it's decreasing um, blood flow to enough like small areas of the heart, it can also cause a lot of heart damage as well. If you click one more, Stuart. It's quite difficult to diagnose microvessel disease because if you look at the angiogram that we saw in the, um, previously, you can see that the di it diffuses out as it gets to the smaller vessels. So while the major blood vessels are very dark and very prominent, and you can see if there's like reduced flow in one area, you can't actually see a lot of the tiny vessels, and there's infinitely more of those that are not even picked up on through the dye. So that's why it can be really hard to um, distinguish whether a woman's vessels are completely clear of microvessel disease because it's just very difficult to image it at that level at this point. If you could just backtrack one slide there, spasm. So spasm means to me the artery is injured. So um, you can have, in theory, pure spasm on normal arteries. Pretty rare. Most people who have spasm have injured arteries. Um, and that's why angina, if you have blocked arteries, they're still prone to spasm. An injured artery can have spasm on top of it. Um, and my first uh, recollection of learning about spasm was in people who used too much cocaine and injured the artery causes spasm, and that was a mechanism for, for heart attack. Um, spasm tends to occur usually at the same time of the day, that's usually at nighttime waking you up, and we can actually use uh, Holter monitoring or monitoring looking for something called ST analysis, so that can be picked up. So spasm is a form of an injured artery. Um, and you mentioned things like smoking um, um, plays a big role this certain you know recreational drugs that are inappropriately uh, used are another cause as well and it looks like in my mind is that uh, central adiposity or, or that you know that that, that having that mid gut a uh, big uh, butt uh, causes inflammation and may likely cause more spasm high triglycerides low HDL smoking uh, this is more. This seems to affect women more than males. Men can be affected as well, but not to the same degree. Where microvascular disease is uh, again, we don't. We're starting to learn how to image this. But basically, you can think of the, the large vessels are open. The major four hundred three, the major highways are open, but the side roads are closed, and they're they're they're, they're getting blocked over time. So that's sort of emerging technology, and uh, and this actually causes a lot of. Uh, discomfort, a lot of morbidity, and and, uh, and it's something that uh, we're, we're learning a lot. And so one of the struggles when I see uh, anybody with chest pain, it, are your large vessels open is a question I'd like to know. So the stress test can help us and maybe an angiogram if necessary or, or some form of modality. But trying to figure out the small vessels, is that pain coming from the heart, the, the small vessels, or from spasm of the artery, hard to diagnose? Or is the pain coming from something else, just because I have chronic pain, I have fibromyalgia, I have arthritis, I have esophageal spasm as well, so it makes it more challenging, um, and uh, so it's something that takes longer to, to, to diagnose at times, and something that uh, I think we're more attuned to at this stage, it's something we're recognizing better, but uh, a lot of people have, have depression, aches and pains that just cause chest pain that are not heart-related as well, so that just also blends into that equation, so... 
work with your doctor to find out if, if, if it is coming from your heart or not. And, and you won't get it right the first time. It's just through trial and error. You know, traditionally, we, we use something like nitrates and calcium blockers that treat vasospasm and microcirculation better. We use beta blockers we tend to use. These are different medications for the heart uh, that are traditional for uh, traditional blocked arteries and protect the heart from uh, future heart attacks. So, uh, uh, we do have therapies, and we're still learning a lot about this. Next slide, please. Again, the angiogram. And so, again, what, what Rachel's team and others are going to talk about is that it's fascinating diagnosis, but please, let's just prevent this from happening. Yeah, so we talked about a lot of different types of heart disease that can occur in women um, and how we can go about diagnosing them. But like Dr. Kuni mentioned, we can diagnose in so many different ways. We can also prevent in so many different ways, so we don't need to get to that diagnosis uh, at one point. And basically what causes all these different types of heart disease, they are the same, whether it's um, the spasm, the microvessel disease, the plaque rupture. There are some unique factors as well that we'll touch on in the next part of the presentation. But pretty much if your diet is poor, if you're overweight, you're not active, if your genetics are working against you, uh, if you're a smoker, if you have diabetes, and just as you get older, our risk of having heart disease increases infinitely and we need to work on the prevention first. And so in the next part of the presentation, we'll touch on um, the different risk factors in women and how heart disease can look different, like and present different from the symptom wise in women. Yes, so to start, women have more non obstructive coronary artery disease. So they tend to have the microvascular disease, and this can lead to some atypical symptoms. So women present with discomfort rather than a crushing pain, shortness of breath, fatigue, indigestion, nausea, back or neck pain. So it's not your traditional heart attack symptoms that you think of. So the left side of chest pain radiating into your arm or your jaw, it can be quite different and quite vague. So recognizing these signs is kind of important because if a woman is presenting with these symptoms or feeling these symptoms, it's important to consider that it could potentially be a heart attack. If you can backtrack, you know, is that, you know, you don't always get a heart attack the first time around. So that's why you have to be a detective. What brings them on? If I get um, uh, discomfort after eating a hamburger and I burp and I get the sour taste in my mouth, it's probably reflux. If I get pain when I press on my chest wall or when I, after I fell and injured myself, it's probably a muscle problem. If I had this chronic aches and pain after a car crash for five years, that's probably muscle pain. So, but pain that from the heart really makes that makes me nervous is when I, you know, I shovel the snow, I'm walking the dog, um, um, and it goes away quickly after I sit or rest, that's most likely to be heart-related. Um, pain that gets better with uh, nitroglycerin makes me think of uh, the nitroglycerin relieves spasm, and it opens the artery, so we can use that. Pain that gets better, or shortness of breath, or tightness in my chest uh, that gets better after a puff of Ventolin. If I've been a smoker and I wheeze and I cough, that can give me tightness in the chest as well. So you have to be a detective too as well. So work with your healthcare team um, uh, to look at this. Um, you know, if I'm always tired, fatigued, I have no energy, um, I lost my joy of life, um, um, I, I feel sad most of the time. Well, we need, to, we need to think about how we treat our depression and things of that nature as well. So think about, you know, how to be part of the healthcare team. We're supposed to be a team approach right now. And if you say, you doctor, figure it out, we'll try to figure it out, but let's figure it out together. Uh, and because the diagnosis is much more complicated uh, for women, uh, we need to work as a better team with, with tests to do when appropriate. And what's your thoughts about it as well? Um, and uh, don't be afraid to, um, um, you know, say your doctor, this is what I think this pain is coming from. What do you think? And let's, let's, let's try to prove or disprove that. That's a wonderful conversation. Today, for instance, I had a wonderful conversation with a nice lady who was having trouble with her blood pressure. She suggested uh, uh, a change in her blood pressure pills. And that's kind of nice that, uh, uh, that she came up with a solution that was wonderful. So, um, I keep hearing people all the time, I want to take away therapies, and uh, I want to add the right therapy at the right time. Um, um, 
Because again, heart disease is preventable with a combination of diet, lifestyle changes, and the appropriate procedures at the right time. Thanks so much for sharing that. Go ahead. I'm learning more. Thank you. So before I go into the women's specific risk factors, I'm just going to talk about some of the traditional risk factors and how the risk is a little bit different for women as well. So in terms of diabetes, when we co compare diabetic women to non-diabetic women, there's a three time increased risk for fatal coronary artery disease for diabetic women compared to non-diabetic women. And there's also a higher risk for a myocardial infarction or heart attack for diabetic women compared to diabetic men, earlier occurrence of heart attacks in diabetic women than diabetic men, and higher risk of ischemic heart failure and stroke in diabetic women than in diabetic men. So while diabetes itself is a risk factor for different types of heart disease, you can see that the risk that women present with versus men can be a little bit different. It's higher. Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of hypertension, another risk factor for various types of cardiac disease, there's a higher prevalence of hypertension in women over the age of 60 than in men, which might have to do with the increased risk of menopause, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and then a higher risk of myocardial infarction or heart attacks in women with hypertension than men with hypertension, and higher risk of stroke in women with hypertension than men with hypertension. So again, hypertension is a risk factor for cardiac disease, but the risk can be higher in women than in men. So I'll remind people that in North America, you face a 90% chance of developing hypertension over your lifetime. Um, who should have a blood pressure machine? Everybody should have a blood pressure machine. So we have so many videos on blood pressure. Please, you deserve to have your own blood pressure machine. Consider getting one if you can get one. So some other traditional risk factors, so dyslipidemia, so dysregulated um, fats and things like that. In women, it's associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and can also be harder to manage in women. The impact of obesity in women also tends to be greater and females who are smokers have a higher risk of a heart attack or stroke compared to men who smoke. And also physical inactivity tends to be a trend that's higher among women. So in terms of considering risk factors or traditional risk factors for cardiac disease, we think of smoking, high blood pressure, high blood cholesterol, physical inactivity, um, diabetes, and all of these things can present with a higher risk in women when it comes to developing cardiac disease. So those were some of the traditional risk factors, but there's a lot of emerging research on the new risk factors, and a lot of them tend to be unique to women. So preterm delivery, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, gestational diabetes, autoimmune diseases, which affect both women and men, but women have a higher chance of getting autoimmune diseases because of just the way the immune system works and genetics also plays a component in that. Uh, breast cancer treatment and depression, which also affects men and women, but can have some pretty profound effects for women who are faced with cardiovascular disease. So, Didi, thanks for sharing this slide. So, if if you, as a woman, have gestational diabetes or high blood pressure during your pregnancy, before, during, or after, you're going to have a higher incidence of diabetes in the future, and you will have a higher incidence of heart disease. So this is actually a stress test for future heart attacks and strokes. So really go back and pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, uh, you know, oh, the diabetes went away, the blood pressure went away, it's coming back. It's in, you've injured your vessel, there's going to be future injury. So that's basically new information that you should know right now. Um, and we also know is that, you know, when you treat cancer, such, such as breast cancer, for instance, some of the therapies damage the heart. And... Uh, um, and, and for many cancers that you're giving therapies that are destroying cells, and some of them are good cells. And so basically cancer itself is a risk factor for heart disease. Um, and some of the specific therapies for breast cancer can actually injure the heart. Um, and uh, I'm interested to think about, uh, you know, autoimmune diseases. And so what we learned right now is that inflammation plays a big role. So being overweight increases inflammation. We now have therapies such as colchicine that we use actually now for probably for COVID and we treat for gout and also we can treat for heart disease at this point in time. Uh, depression, sadness um, is a huge problem um, and we need to think about, I'm not a great psychiatrist, but 
one of the greatest joys I have is uh, is when I'm having a bad day, getting out and seeing some fresh air, seeing the sun. Um, sun is good for depression. Sun is good, and fresh air is good for the heart and exercise. So, anybody who wants, on uh, we have our, our our weight loss club on Tuesdays at seven o'clock. Or we call the three M's: meditation, mindfulness, and movement. And me- and uh, are on Wednesdays at seven o'clock. So I do the Shadok stairs at seven. I'd love to see you there. Um, Adam and I do the uh, Shadok stairs for morning risers at six a.m. Monday and Wednesday. So. I, I try to at least four times a week do some stairs. You can do two stairs, or you can do multiple steps, but do something. Um, I always feel sore during them, but so much more, so much better afterwards. And so, one of the best, best antidepressants, at least for me, is is activity. And I wish I could give more people the joy of uh, activity and connect togetherness and things of nature. And I really thank all our, our, our crew, people like Didi and. Aislinn and everybody else that have put together these programs. So there, there's so many people like yourselves that have made such a huge difference. And I thank you and our patients thank you. Um, so you guys made me healthier and uh, and uh, helped me keep uh, my mood up. And uh, we all have bad days, but uh, togetherness, uh, sharing, uh, activity are, are, are crucial. Now, if you really have a severe depression, I'm the wrong guy for you. Um, but uh, if you have minor depression, I think I'm the right person for you if you want to take some steps in that direction. So I encourage that in some way uh, with your significant other and groups uh, in your so-called bubble. Uh, find ways of incorporating it. It's, it's such a joy. And I feel bad for too many people who don't get that joy. So speaking specifically about pregnancy-related risk factors, the first being hypertension. So there's three kind of types that can occur. So there's gestational hypertension, which is basically new onset hypertension in a mom who was in hypertensive before pregnancy. So that's over 140, over 99 mmHg, and that happens after 20 weeks of gestation. And then there's chronic hypertension, which is new onset hypertension, and this happens before 20 weeks of gestation. Severe hypertension is when you go above 160 over 110, and this puts you at an increased risk of preeclampsia. And then preeclampsia, the main concern that exists with hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, is new onset hypertension. It's after 20 weeks of gestation, but what makes it different from gestational hypertension is you also present with proteinuria or some other type of organ dysfunction, usually involving your kidneys. And in terms of the risk, so with preeclampsia, there's a 3.7-fold relative risk of developing hypertension 14 years after pregnancy, 2.6 for ischemic heart disease after 12 years after pregnancy, um, 1.81 for stroke 10 years after pregnancy, and 1.79 for venous thromboembolism. Um, after five years after pregnancy. So even though preeclampsia is something that goes away after pregnancy, it can still hold a risk for the future and you're at risk for developing a variety of different cardiac diseases or events because you've ha- experienced that during the pregnancy. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of being proactive and preventive. So it's important to remember, so just to keep things simple, if you have high blood pressure around before, during, or after pregnancy, your risk of a future heart attack, or stroke, or blood clots is doubled for your lifetime. So that, that, that's important information. So you can actually take steps at that point in time, because we learned is that the longer you treat, the better off you are. So it gives you a good incentive to watch your children, your grandchildren grow old, is to, to make yourself healthy. So the next one is gestational diabetes, and this one's kind of interesting because there's been a couple of studies recently that has talked about how type 2 diabetes can kind of be masked in women, and it's actually pregnancy sometimes that might reveal type 2 diabetes. So if you happen to present with diabetes in the first trimester of your pregnancy, you get diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Gestational diabetes is one that happens after the first trimester, and it's because your body cannot produce enough insulin during pregnancy, so you tend to have these periods of hyperglycemia. So gestational diabetes does pose a risk for developing diabetes, so there's a seven-fold increased risk for developing diabetes later on in life. And as I mentioned, diabetes is already a risk for various cardiac events. And 
adding on to this risk, so independent of the risk that diabetes already poses for cardiac disease, with gestational diabetes, there's a twofold risk for increase for stroke and a fourfold risk increase of myocardial infarction or heart attack. And there's also an increased risk for preeclampsia, which then produces an increased risk for other cardiac diseases. Wow, it's good to know. So a couple of other pregnancy-related risk factors, there's persistence of weight. So it's hard to lose weight after pregnancy. You do put on quite a bit while the baby is growing. So weight one year postpartum is actually a good predictor of being overweight 15 years later, studies have found. So that's something to keep in mind in terms of like losing that weight after pregnancy and recognizing that if that weight took a lot more time to come off, maybe there's some things that you want to do proactively or preventatively to prevent gaining that sort of weight in the future and there's also peripartum cardiomyopathy and this is a pretty rare condition but it's an idiopathic so no particular trigger left ventricular dysfunction that occurs during or after a pregnancy um, it's also called pregnancy associated cardiomyopathy so it's pretty rare but there is a higher incidence in african-american women and the risk for developing this does increase if you do have preeclampsia so one thing to remember for uh, breastfeeding is, is wonderful for two reasons. One is wonderful for the baby. They become smarter, better, healthier babies. And it's good for the mom because it helps get rid of some of the calories. And uh, so I think, you know, uh, how long should people be breastfeeding at this point in time, Rachel? So I think there's actual evidence that if a woman breastfeeds exclusively, so only breastfeeding for six months, um, it has incre increased benefit for both the mom and baby, lower infection for the baby, and it's very well proven to the WHO. And you can breastfeed up to like 12, 18, 24 months if your milk is still being produced. There's not a lot of harms associated with that. Um, and in fact, breast milk just has a lot of nutrients and it has the ability to adapt to the baby's needs based on some magic chemical interaction that's going on when you're breastfeeding. Uh, and it can also help promote more immune mediated um, mm -hmm. protection as well because you get the immune protection from the mom being transferred to the baby. So as long as you can, um, again, we recognize that not every mom can breastfeed and that's fully fine to supplement with formula, but there should be no you know, barriers to breastfeeding if that's what you want to do and that's what you can do. It's kind of interesting because breast milk actually changes at the beginning of breastfeeding is a higher fat content as, as the as, as the baby gets fuller there's more water content and there's also uh, passing immunity uh, and also probably pa passing uh, different fatty chains that we don't understand so we talk about DHA and EPA and we try to supplement but mother nature has developed the, 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 the key to success so I, I really believe is that uh, is that we haven't taken advantage of mother nature we try you know we as physicians and healthcare providers just try to do a good job but nature and that says for everything is that uh, we process food we add things to our food supply is that real natural whole food is important and breast milk is, is best for mom and best for baby so uh, encourage people to uh, to learn from experts about this and to and to uh, to breastfeed appropriately whenever possible so that's you know that's really amazing what mother nature has done and uh, um, Thank you for sharing that. Think of breastfeeding too. We were actually discussing it in one of my classes where a midwife was talking about the importance of breastfeeding. It's also associated with lower anxiety and postpartum depression in the mother. So it has like a whole bunch of effects for the baby, but it actually helps with like the mom's mental health during that postpartum period as well. Um, and then for some other female specific or other risk factors, so breast cancer treatment, the radiotherapy can increase the rate of ischemic heart disease and radiation, especially in the left breast, is associated with coronary artery disease when compared to the right breast. There's also hormone therapy. So Rachel already mentioned hormone replacement therapy and the kind of a disputed topic, not necessarily something that's actually protective. But when we think about other types of hormone therapy, so oral contraceptives, those can be associated with an increased risk of stroke. So in terms of like birth control pills, the risk for developing things like a blood clot is not very high, but combined with other conditions and pre-existing medical conditions, it can be a cause for concern. So one of those things is smoking. So just included a little diagram on the right. But basically, 
the risk for cardiovascular disease increases if you smoke and you take certain types of birth control. And there's also differences in terms of the formulation and the strength of birth control. So if you're a smoker or have pre-existing cardiovascular conditions, that's definitely something to discuss if that's an avenue you're planning to take because there will likely need to be a lot of discussion about whether or not you're eligible to take birth control and whether certain formulations might work better for you. It's kind of interesting about hormone replacement therapy. We started off in saying that um, that uh, grass milk has a lot of wonderful properties, and that uh, what we try to do is to give hormone replacement therapy after the menopause. Our, our first generation of hormones got it wrong, and uh, I'll, I'll never forget when the HERS trial came out is that, that we knew that women who took hormone replacement therapy had less heart disease. By observational data but we actually went to high quality randomized data it showed that it actually hurt women so I'll repeat that when we did proper randomized controlled trials that giving hormone replacement therapy after the menopause and many of these women were over five years after the menopause it actually increased the risk of a heart attack it made larger strokes and it tripled the amount of blood clots that took place because the hormones estrogens and even premarin causes clotting abnormality. So we try to experiment with other different hormones at this point in time, but the answer right now is that hormone replacement therapy after the menopause, and I'll say this right now, is that we know for sure um, it causes harm at least five years afterwards, and if you need to take hormones at this stage, you take them because it controls your symptoms and your risk of heart disease and stroke is relatively controlled. So your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your weight, you're not smoking, uh, you're exercising, you're taking care of your mental health, are controlled. And uh, and so while there's controversy, uh, in my mind, uh, we, we've shown that hormone replacement therapy does a lot more harm to the cardiovascular system after the menopause. So if someone wants to say it's safe around the menopause, I think we haven't proven that in my mind. Um, so, so to me... Um, that's new learning for, for many of us right now. And there's still a lot more to learn because different preparations of hormones are obviously coming out and, and changing. But uh, uh, right now is that uh, that's where I sit at this point in time. I remember these debates for the last 20 years. Um, um, and that's why we need to do proper large-scale randomized control trials to sort this out. Uh, and God, we trust everything else needs data. And the last risk factor I'll talk about, oh, just go back one slide, is uh, depression. So in women with depression, there's an increased risk of mortality after an acute heart attack compared to men with depression, which kind of speaks to kind of the psychological impact on like physiological symptoms. So in terms of depression in women, it can pose a higher risk for like um, having mortality after a particular cardiac event. So it's kind of interesting if you just go back to that slide again, depression, anxiety, and things of that nature, is that uh, I don't think we've done a really good job of treating that well and how to, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes hard to make the diagnosis, uh, but we have to be tuned to that. And I think women pay a higher price for that compared to males and uh Traditionally, cardiac rehab programs where, where, where Rachel was saying that women don't tend to go into these things because they're predominantly exercise-based. And uh, many guys uh, have done sporting all their life, and women tend to drop out of sports quicker than, than, than males do. Uh, so I'm encouraging people to use activity in sport, but also, too, is that we as a community need to figure out how to tend to the emotional needs better. So whether that be meditation, yoga, a relaxation, just pure walking. Uh, my wife would say, "Don't solve the problem. Just, just be quiet and listen to me. Uh, don't say anything." And uh, one thing I have to learn to listen better uh, because I always wanted to solve problems. Sometimes the problem to solve is just being listening and be attentive to that. So, if you struggle from depression and anxiety, uh, make sure you find the right people to help you with that because there's many experts out there uh, that can help in that circumstance. Thank you for sharing that. So and finally to talk about menopause. So menopause is a natural process and menopause itself is not 
causing risks, but it's associated with certain risk factors and the risk of certain lifestyle interventions or things that you're doing can't increase during like the menopausal period. So diets that are high in fat or smoking either before or during menopause poses a higher risk. So it's important to be proactive about those decisions. And the increased risk of cardiovascular disease is associated with a decline in estrogen. So estrogen is thought to have a lot of cardioprotective effects. So protecting the muscle, also modulating the way that your body processes cholesterol and keeping that on the low end, and also in reducing blood pressure. So it's thought that the decline in estrogen causes all of these initial protective processes to disappear, which can, which is kind of why postmenopausal women tend to present with a higher risk for cardiovascular disease when they have any sort of risk factor in comparison to men who have the same risk factor. So hypertension prevalence, especially um, of postmenopausal women, is more than twice the prevalence of premenopausal women. And women with premature menopause may also be at more risk. There is nothing you can do about that because it's a natural process, but it's just something to think about and consider when you're talking about uh, primary prevention or being proactive. And finally, dyslipidemia also gets harder to control with menopause, potentially related to the way that estrogen can modulate your body's processing effects. And... On the right, I just have the um, relationship of cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, and stroke in terms of like the age at which you reach menopause. So the later you reach menopause, the more protected you tend to be. So women are also at an increased risk of certain types of diseases. So this is Takotsubo, which is also called broken heart syndrome or stress cardiomyopathy. And it more than 90% of reported cases tend to be in women, usually between the ages of 58 to 75. And it's the weakening of the left ventricle due to severe physical or emotional stress. And as you can see in the um, image below, it kind of, the left ventricle kind of takes on the shape of a Japanese octopus trap, which is why this disease has this name. So it's a higher incidence in females. And the other disease, as Rachel mentioned, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So this is the sudden separation of the layers of a coronary artery wall. And 80% of the patients who present with this are generally female. And the average age actually tends to be about 45 years. And 20 to 25% of cases can occur during the peripartum period, so in and around pregnancy. And recurrence can uh, recurrence after 10 years occurs in about 20% of cases. And again, these cases are mostly women. So they do present an increased risk for sp spontaneous coronary artery dissection that tends to be more common in women, even though it's a rare condition to begin with. Well, we have a lot to learn about this disease. We can see that it's easier to, to measure, to figure this out during the time of uh, childbearing because our, our our antennas are up for this and uh and uh, so the disease looks different so to me this means the artery is injured in some way so to me when i see individuals who have gone through this so-called scad um I, I treat the risk factors such as blood pressure their cholesterol their, their smoking if you smoke and you have scad you smoke and um uh it's something that you really have to think about this and you, you mentioned that you know certain risk factors are more common and women pay a higher price for this. So this is actually, uh, we tend to have our antennas and think about more in women. How, how common this is in males? Probably not as common, but we'll probably underdiagnose this in males too as well. So uh, uh, remarkable. This is something that, you know, 10, 20 years ago was unheard of. We didn't know about it. We just didn't recognize it. Now, we have to, now that we recognize it, we need to know how to treat it better, and we still have a lot to learn. Now we're going to move on to talk about two trials um, that demonstrate some recent evidence in the field of why it might be so difficult to diagnose women with heart disease. So the first one is the Minoka trial that was in 2020. It's a super recent trial that was just presented last year. And Minoka is the name of the trial and it also stands for myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. So basically you don't have any blockage of arteries that were detected by angiogram, but the woman somehow still had a heart attack. To me, this is a game-changing study. This was presented at the 
American Heart Association in March 2020. It was one of the most important trials of that meeting, um, and it really put together uh, a lot of understanding. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, Rachel is going to review that with us. Tell us about Minoka. All right, so like we mentioned before, heart attack without blocked arteries, so non-obstructive being less than around 50% stenosis. And the current um, theory is that this is a, accounts for 5 to 6% of heart, all heart attacks, and it disproportionately affects women. So what the Minoka trial did is it included 301 women who were diagnosed with a heart attack, uh, and that could be through ECG changes and elevated troponin, which is a marker in your blood for damaged heart muscle. Uh, and then they performed additional cardiac CT or OCT, that's like the fancy imaging that we showed before, as well as MRI to see um, if there was additional or like new damage that could have been shown on there, even though they had a normal angiogram. So this is actually important. So traditionally, when someone came into the hospital, they had a heart attack, so the troponin level means heart damage was elevated. They, the story was they were feeling well, and they got this tightness, this chest pain, there were some EKG changes, they went for an angiogram, and I hate the word not blocked arteries. The arteries were blocked, they were just not severely blocked. So traditionally, uh, if you have a, a, a heart attack, uh, and it could be totally blocked off, and that's why you go to the hospital, that's called something called an ST elevation infarction. That's a medical emergency where you have a blood clot form on top of, let's say, about 60-70% blockage, the artery is totally blocked, it's easy to recognize, and that gets stented and opened, and that's where actually mortality of heart disease has decreased dramatically. So the best time to have a stent is when you're having a, when you have a blocked artery with a blood clot on a partial blockage of that. When I look at angiograms right now, um, I look at, it, is there mild disease or no disease whatsoever? So to me, when you have minor disease with a heart attack, you're in trouble. Uh, you're not in trouble today, uh, but you're going to be in trouble in the, the future. So it's really important to understand the difference between minor blockage uh, and, and uh, severe blockages. So we talked about that 50% blockage. Uh, and if you have minor disease, the artery could have been blocked, spasm, and it can, the, clot, the clot could be dissolved in that area. So, um, But this is actually... Uh, a landmark paper that's showing that uh, many times we sent women home uh, thinking that you know, the heart attack, which it didn't make sense, the arteries weren't severely blocked. So let's find out what happened to these women. All right, so um, out of 301 women that were in, uh, included, 116 of them had normal angiograms. So then they went they on. Weren't normal. They didn't have severe blockage. They didn't have severe blockage. Sorry, I'll say that. So they didn't have severe blockage on angiograms, so less than 50% blockage on angiograms. So then they got sent to do the OCT and a cardiac MRI study. And what they found was that in women who didn't have obvious or severe blockage on angiogram, uh, almost 50% had abnormalities on the OCT imaging, and then 75% had abnormalities on MRI imaging. So if you look on the right here, we'll kind of talk through it. Um, on the top panel, we have the OCT findings, the far right being no OCT culprit, so they were normal on that imaging as well. And then the left panel being there was some abnormalities on the OCT imaging. Uh, so, so remember, the OCT was that, that fancy Star Wars device you saw. So you had the dye test, and after the dye test, they put down this fancy light into the vessel. It had a more detailed look at the vessels at a much deeper level. Uh, again, very experimental. Really, this is not part of routine practice yet. Uh, and they found that there was a lot more disease in that vessel wall, very diffuse disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the woman who didn't have the severe blockage, it was around 50-50 whether they had some abnormalities on the OCT or the fancy imaging. Uh, and then also, again, in the woman who didn't have severe blockage on angiogram, when we look at the MR, 25%, uh, as you can see in that top green like row, uh, had normal MR, and then 75% had abnormalities shown on MRI. So this is kind of showing us, it's, it's super confusing on how we can go about diagnosing cardiac disease in women and really getting down to the root cause of what's going on and what's damaging the heart. Because we're looking at three different imaging modalities here. All of these women didn't have severe blockage on angiogram. Half of them had some sort of anomalies on another fancy um, device that we're not even being able to use regularly in practice right now. And 75% of those women also had anomalies on MR. And there isn't... Um, there is some crossover where there's abnormalities on MRI, but then there was normal 
OCT and then where there was normal OCT, but then there, um, or there was abnormality in OCT, but then a normal MR. So it's really unclear. It's kind of showing us that so many different modalities are need to be used to really thoroughly investigate what's going on in a woman. And since not all of these are readily available, uh, just because someone may not have severe coronary artery disease, you can't just definitively say that they're not at high risk of having heart um, another heart cardiac event or they don't have damage present because multiple imaging modalities have been used in this trial and they still didn't really pick up all of what was going on underneath and there were some conflicts and discrepancies and we had to really piece together the puzzles to thoroughly diagnose what was actually causing uh, the damage by muscle in the woman. So to me actually um, this is enlightening. So it says to me if you came to the hospital, you had damage to your heart, you had a chest pain syndrome, uh, you showed damage to the heart muscle, um, and there's two types of heart attacks in my mind. There's a heart attack where you have, you have a rupture of a plaque. This is rupture of a plaque. This came spontaneously without warning. It's different when sometimes you go for surgery and that you lose blood supply. You had your hip operation, and we have that called demand infarction. So this is actually an explosion of the vessel, but it's not enough to put the blood clot to close off that vessel entirely. The vessel is already an injured vessel, and we, we found that 75% of the time that you found that there was either disease in the vessel wall at least half the time, or there was damage to the heart muscle, that, that, and part of the heart muscle damage could be something called, uh, you know, from a virus, myocarditis, that they found in some, some women too as well. But you found that in a large percentage, this is muscle injury. Uh, and muscle damage right, to blocked arteries, but a more superficial block, a more diffuse blockage formation. So this tells me I know exactly what to do right now. So if I see a woman that present, or a guy that presents uh, with a heart attack, that there's partial blockage, that means there's disease, and our traditional way of imaging says you don't need an angioplasty today, uh, but what you do need is good preventive strategy. So to me, you need to get your LDL cholesterol less than one. You need to really think about your smoking, your depression, lifestyle changes, activity, your blood pressure, your diabetes. You really need to pay attention to the risk factors because that's what's going to determine your outcome in the future. Um, it's not a false positive. It's just real disease. It's a different type of disease. It's a more diffuse disease. Um, as my wife would say, as women are, are different than males, and, uh, and here's an example of those differences. Don't forget, women go through, we just learned that childbearing is a, is a stress to the cardiovascular system, but the blood pressure surges, the hormonal changes. So to think that disease should be the same in both males and females is a misunderstanding. The disease can be different. And, uh, and here's an example. Uh, this is clear, precise data saying the disease is different, but there's disease there and needs to be treated. And we're going to learn how to treat this better. Yeah, so this, what does this mean? We kind of summarize that pretty well, but again, women are complex, even when it comes to heart disease, and we don't have clear clues for when our coronary artery disease is becoming a significant risk factor for developing a heart attack or other major adverse events that's causing damage to the heart muscle. And imaging and tests that have been used traditionally, and that's still being used as a primary form of imaging and testing right now, is not really able to pick up on all of our risk factors and what's going on underneath. So that prevention and using any type of event or um, heart scare as a way to really take that prevention into place, um, I think is the best option that we have right now moving forward. So Milka tells us the disease is different, that there are some clues, and that you need to work harder on prevention. The same thing with gestational diabetes or, or hypertension during diabetes. They go away, but they come back later to haunt you. So these small vessel diseases, uh, diffuse disease will come back to haunt women later. Uh, and that's what the WISE trial tells. Tell us about the WISE trial. All right, so the WISE trial, this was really interesting because um, this one was different in that it followed women for a long period of time, for 10 years. And it followed 936 women who had symptoms of ischemia. And what we mean by symptoms of ischemia, what the paper uh, described was angina. So that's the typical type of chest pain that's provoked by stress or exertion when you exercise, it goes away with breast or it goes away when you use a nitro spray. Um, and during this period of the 10 year follow up of these women who presented with this exertional chest pain, one in five women had died within that 10 years. 
62% of deaths were from cardiac cases, and 31% of, of the cardiac deaths were actually in women who didn't have severe obstruction on the angiogram that was done 10 years prior. So if you look at the results on the next slide, um, in the woman who has symptoms of angina but no obstructive coronary artery disease on angiogram, the risk of all-cause mortality was 13% within the 10-year period, and the paper cites that the average risk of American women in that age group should be around 2.8%. So even though they didn't have obvious severe blockage on angiogram, their risk of mortality was like six times higher, five, yeah, five, six times higher than what you would normally expect um, for women in that age group. And when they looked at the significant risk factors that kind of predicted what, uh, who would die in that population, it's all the type of risk factors that Adidi um, really elaborated on before, and these were kind of the specific ones that affect women more than men, so diabetes, smoking, hypertension, and elevated triglycerides were all um, risk factors that predicted death in this population. So triglycerides is a different uh, lipid parameter. We, we concentrate a lot on the LDL cholesterol, the lousy cholesterol, but triglycerides are different particles, or something called in remnant particles, and they seem to have a, a worse outcome in, in women at this point in time, and they respond actually extremely well to lifestyle changes, where it's, it's LDL, the lousy cholesterol, responds to diet and lifestyle changes. Uh, triglycerides are lowered three times more effectively of lifestyle changes. So um, I, I hear that women and don't go to cardiac rehab, so if I have um, angina, microvascular disease, uh, exercise, weight reduction, um, um, is, are, are so important. So, so again, if you have diabetes, you smoke, have high blood pressure, treat them. If you have a bad LDL cholesterol, treat them. So this to me is the key here is that uh, don't wait for yourself to die. Wait and then give yourself the, the, the ability to live, to live better and more healthier. Because these women suffered um, and we didn't recognize that uh, they, there was no severe blockage. So when Rachel said they didn't have blocked arteries, she said they didn't have severe blocked arteries. They have blocked arteries. It's just a different form. Remarkable what we learned in the last number of years. So again, what does this mean? It's all kind of pointing back to this thing. We don't have clear signs on when women can be at higher risk of dying from heart disease. And even when women do not have severe obstructive coronary artery disease on angiogram, uh, the symptoms of angina when they were presented, when they were initially enrolled in the study, um, they are still at much greater risk of mortality and on cardiac events. So if we think back to the numbers, it was 13% mortality in the woman that had um, symptoms of angina compared to around 3% that we've seen in normal populations. So that's a four to five-fold increase in mortality. And that's well above the guidelines that we would kind of use to intensively treat someone. If you're four to five times higher risk of dying within 10 years, then you want to do the most intensive treatment that we can. So this um, trial kind of showed that intensive treatment is warranted to reduce significant risk factors when women have these typical angina symptoms. So for instance, I, I saw a, a lady today who's in her 50s. Um, she gets chest discomfort when she walks and exerts herself like she's shoveling snow. She also gets pain for no particular reason. She's had some trauma from a car accident. She gets these, these chest pains for no particular reason. Uh, her stress test was good. Her echo was good. And her coronary angiogram came back totally normal. So that, in my mind, if the now do we believe the angiogram? I, I think I think people are attuned to that. So if the coronary angiogram is totally normal, uh, it probably means that this is not blocked arteries causing it. Could it be spasm of the microcirculation? It's certainly possible. But also, she struggles with depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, other problems as well. So. Sorting this out will take some more work right now. Um, if, on the other hand, this, this, this individual had you know, minor disease of 30% or, or, or minor changes in what we call irregular coronary circulation, if she had a positive biomarker or her stress test was positive for, for chest discomfort, that would lead more to uh, this more diffuse disease. So we have to, it's going to take some time to sort out, but we start off on impression and treat for that. So uh, this person is still on my radar screen. I'm still going to try to encourage her to, uh, to treat her blood pressure better and to treat uh, her cigarettes better. Um, 
but less likely to be this this, this, this disease. But I, I'm still not 100 percent sure. And, and these trials illustrate this: is that uh, um, we need to work hard together. And uh, the fact that the big vessels are open means the side vessels are still a problem. You get a small vessel disease, so we need to work hard at this. Um, um, uh, so that's my my take on some of these sorts of things. So please be attentive to control risk factors. All right, so moving on into what can we actually do to control these risk factors. Um, there's a couple different aspects of this, and some of them involve medical management. So if someone has you know, severe obstructive coronary artery disease of the major vessels, you may have heard of these terms, bypass or stunting, um, what they actually do is either surgically bypass the block blockage of your artery or go through using an angiogram and put a stent to open up your artery. And this was traditionally used for those with really obstructive um, coronary artery, artery disease. You go with a heart attack, they investigate your vessels, you, they see the blockage and they can open them up. And in women, this can this is also you know used for that same purpose, but it's harder in some different ways. One of them being the microvascular circulation could be contributing a lot to some of their um, heart muscle damage, and also in general, women are smaller, they're with smaller body frame, their vessels are smaller, so surgical options may not actually be um, the best way forward, or might be difficult in certain populations of women, so that's something to note there. So bypass surgery and angioplasty and stenting work for blockages greater than 70% to relieve symptoms. They don't make you live longer. In fact, if you have blocked arteries, uh, there's a trial called the ischemia trial, and both males or females having severe blockages up to 90%, you will not necessarily get a survival advantage. In fact, you actually may increase the risk of having a heart attack or stroke because when I take a stent and put that into a vessel that's 80, 90% blocked, you crack that vessel, you cause re a repair, you cause blood clots. In the first two years after uh, an angioplasty, uh, you actually increase the risk of a heart attack compared to a person who didn't have an angioplasty. Maybe long term, you translate that to a benefit for a survival advantage. But right now is that the best time to have an angioplasty is when there's a fresh clot in that artery, the artery is actually injured. Um, so for minor blockages um, and for severe blockage, we have to be very careful when we do for an angioplasty at this stage because a lot of people, the perception is, Angioplasty is better relieving chest pain. It's better for our psychological mind, but it's not necessarily better for survival advantage. Yeah, so what are some things that we can do so we don't even have to get to that severe blockage state and consider angioplasty? And some of that includes medications. So there's multiple different facets that we want to target when it comes to lowering your risk, depending on what type of medical condition you might have. Uh, but in general, lowering your cholesterol with an LDL level less than 1 has been shown to reduce your risk of heart disease even more lower is better. Um, and it can even maybe regress some of the plaque buildup that's been done. And some cholesterol-lowering agents that you may have heard of or commonly used include statins and azetamide. Um, also, making doing strict control of your blood pressure with the various different agents that are available is important. And if you're a diabetic, maintaining strict blood pressure control is also important. Very important as well. So lifestyle, we're going to talk about that in a bit and it's very important and can contribute a lot in terms of lowering your risk but a lot of the times it can't do the whole 100%. We need a combination of a lot of different therapies that are available to help really lower the risk of having any sort of um, event that we don't want to have in the future. I will say this is that what you want is not the low dose of the statin, it's a high dose of the statin. So etorvastatin, Lipitor, 80 milligrams a day, Ruvastatin, Crestor, 40 milligrams a day, and 10 milligrams of Zetamide. If you take it for five years or greater, can lower the risk of having a heart attack or stroke by 60%. Uh, so that's really its prolongation of life. For every 10 millimeters reduction in blood pressure, there's a 10% reduction in fatal heart attacks a 20% reduction in non-fail heart attack, a 30% reduction in stroke and congestive heart failure. Those are the two one-two combination drug therapy. Aspirin decreases risk of heart attack by about 10 to 15%. So it has a small benefit, but it increase, in, increases risk of bleeding by about 50%. Tight blood sugar control lowers the risk of having a heart attack by only 10 to 15%. So uh, while well, it's important to prevent things like eye damage and kidney damage, uh, blood sugar control has a very small impact on preventing a heart attack or stroke at this stage. 
So the big guns are your cholesterol and your blood pressure, as well as lifestyle changes. But lifestyle changes have been shown in a trial called Look Ahead that took patients who had type 2 diabetes and uh, they promoted weight reduction, good eating, good group support. It was stopped because of futility. It didn't work by itself. So um, lifestyle changes, once you have severe blocked arteries, are not enough for most people to protect their vessels. I'll repeat that. Lifestyle changes are good for prevention. They have lots of effects on quality of life for less medications and you feel better. Um, if you want to prevent a heart attack, you need to lose at least 20 pounds um, for a period of five years or greater. And there's ways of doing it, and that's why you should look at this. But medications are very crucial to many people's support to prevent and to treat heart disease. So, um, so, but don't forget lifestyle changes, but don't forget the power of the right medications at the right time. Yeah, that the next couple of slides just go into a little bit more detail about the cholesterol lowering ones, since a lot of patients in the clinic tend to have questions on how they're different. Uh, the two main ones, and we're talking about the stats that Dr. Cooney kind of mentioned. So there's the statins, and their mechanism is the lost cholesterol production in the liver. So we want that high dose statin, and it'll lower LDL cholesterol by 50% giving you a 50% lower risk of heart attack when taken for five years or greater. And then easy troller is uh, This is a different mechanism from the statin. It blocks cholesterol absorption in the gut, and this can lower LDL cholesterol by an additional 10 to 15%. When you go into the next slide, here's that um, big stat that Dr. Kenny just said. So together, a combination of a high dose statin and easy troll can lower your risk of heart attack or heart disease by 60%. So if I had SCAD or if I had uh, minor regular my coronary circulation and I had a heart attack, this is should be their standard of care mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. The best time to stop these medications is the day after you die. And is there a difference in the men versus women response to these medications? Since we're doing a talk on women's health and cardiovascular disease. Well, in 2011, there was a meta-analysis where they combined 18 randomized controlled trials, so very good data, with over 1, 140,000 patients, seeing if there is actually a gender difference um, in terms of the protective effect of statin medications. And the good news is both women and men benefited very well from statins and women cardiac events and death. And women actually benefited more than men when it comes to using statins for primary prevention. And what we mean by that is when women who never had a, a major heart event in the past and the statins were put on to prevent them from having their first cardiac event, they benefited a little bit better than men. So we're kind of at an advantage when it comes to statins. We can get more bang for a buck there. So it's, um, as Dr. Cooney mentioned, lifestyle changes are important, but statins do work really well. And it's been proven to work very well in the woman population that they looked separately at that. So it works in young women, old women, young men, old men. And when I first talked about this to my wife, she said, I, I know this, women are always women always outperform men. So there you go, here's an example. <laughs> All right, so I think now we're gonna move on to uh, talking about lifestyle changes, if you wanna take over. <laughs> so this is just some general lifestyle changes that you should consider to make, especially if you have any of the risk factors or cardiac disease is a concern for you. So managing your blood pressure, we've already talked about how hypertension poses a bigger risk for women with cardiovascular disease, so definitely managing your blood pressure is something that needs to be done. S stopping smoking, so we discussed how women who smoke are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease than men who smoke. Eating healthy, getting active, so losing weight, obesity tends to impact women a little bit more in terms of like actual effects that obesity has on the body. So getting that weight under control is also an important part of the process. Controlling your cholesterol and reducing your blood sugar, because as we discussed, diabetes can be an increased risk predictor for women. So when it comes to weight, so many people in North America are now been overweight. And traditionally, men and women, in a way that they're different, is the way that they carry their body weight. So women, we tend to have more of that pair glass shape where we have more um, weight in our thighs and our hips, whereas men tend to bulge out kind of like an apple and have a lot of this like big beer belly gut. Um, and what we kind of know about that is the fat around your stomach, that's more dangerous when it comes to having cardiac events. And what we've kind of been noticing over time too, maybe not... Um, 
not a lot of good evidence for it so far in terms of like child and all of that but just their observation as women are getting more overweight in general with the population there's been a lot of women coming to the clinic and around us that actually also have this very similar what we call central adiposity with these large stomachs around their um, the large stomachs and a lot of like dangerous fat that puts them at high risk of having cardiac events so if you have you tend to have the body type where you store fat around your abdomen you're at a higher risk of having cardiac disease and it's very important to work on the weight loss to lower that risk and there's a, a whole series of videos and workshops that we have if you want to work on this. And we can do it together and have fun. Uh, it took me 60 years to get to my ideal body weight. Uh, I don't know if I'll keep it or not, but I'm sure enjoying working at it with our exercise group and with our weight loss group. And I appreciate our, our students and the staff and all my patient support to do this. And my, my family, my wife, my daughter, my son. Um, our sons, it, it really, it really, and of course our our, our dogs, cats. <laughs> uh, it takes a whole community to get the weight down, and uh, so uh, please don't ignore this. Um, love your body, but love less of your body for for eighty percent of us. It's actually the message that we're gonna talk about on the next slide. Uh, we don't mean to make anyone feel bad about being overweight or anything like that, but with this new generation, there's this whole body positivity movement, which I think is good for a lot of different reasons. It makes us have more confidence. It makes the general public less judgmental. And I think it's good for younger women who may struggle with body image issues growing up and that can really contribute negatively to mental health. But if you click again, Stuart, the message that you want to get through is yes, you should love your body and you should love it enough to keep it healthy. So you can love your body and you can love the way it looks. But the real truth is having that excess weight is bad for multiple different things. It's bad for your heart, it's bad for multiple different organ systems and it just puts you at increased risk of heart attack and stroke and um, pre premature death, which is not something that anyone would want. So again, you can love your body and you should love it. You should love it even more and love it enough to actually keep it healthy and going. So one thing to remember, we all love our kids and our grandkids. Do you love your kids and grandkids enough to lose weight so they'll be healthier too? And a reason why we really want to push um, the importance of weight loss, we talked a lot about the effects on the cardiovascular system, but it can have so many other beneficial effects on other types of body systems as well. Uh, when you're obese or severely overweight, your lungs are um, affected and it can cause abnormal function. You can have obstructive sleep apnea with difficulty sleeping that can eventually cause high blood pressure and increase your risk even more. Uh, the high blood pressure that comes with being overweight can cause stroke, uh, can damage your eyes and cause cataracts, you can cause severe pancreatitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is also another so you can see all these bad things, but basically you feel miserable, you're, you're tired, you're fatigued, you have no energy, your, your body gets tired of carrying this weight, for, for, I mean, it just wears out. Uh, you know, you don't pull a tractor or behind your car every day, so um, I know it's hard, but it's so, have the joy of, of, of just trying to do something better or different. And we have a whole series of webinars, we have some things to work with you, uh, do something. Yeah, one of the things that you can do is exercise. So we're going to talk about um, the guidelines for exercise moving forward. But as you get older, um, you can look at this clinical frailty scale and see kind of where you would fit on um, where you think you would fit on that and how just constant exercise and regular exercise over time can help prevent you from becoming more and more frail as you age. Um, on the right here is Jane Fonda. She's a little bit out of my generation, but Dr. Kearney mentioned that she was quite an icon for a lot of the time. And what I know of her, she's quite an exercise guru, and she's still looking really great at the age she is right now. And if Jane Fonda didn't exercise as much and wasn't as much of a health nut guru as she was back in the day, she could be using a walker like you see right there. But instead, um, if you look at her, clinical frailty score, I think most people would say she's still very, very fit at the old age that she is now. So I think one of the things that uh, I was just at a, uh, a webinar uh, for our, our hospital, and, and basically the, the province is actually gearing up for multiple waves of, uh, of COVID. 
And if it gets to the point where we get overwhelmed, you will not have a choice who goes on a respirator. It will be decided based on one part is on your fragility score, uh, best chance of survival. Um, and to me, uh, right now is that I've seen so many people gain weight during COVID, which makes absolutely no biologic sense. I understand the challenge of it, but you know what? People may have gained 19 pounds. I lost 19 pounds. Um, and I did that because it's important to be as healthy for as long as you can. So, so hopefully one day I get to meet Jane Fonda and we can go, we can go fight for the environment and maybe get arrested together uh, for some sort of environmental factor. Um, but it's really important to uh, take a stand, and one of the stands is activity. I noticed that Aislinn's on this uh, webinar, and she, she and her group has put together a wonderful, uh, called the three M's, which is meditation, motivation, and movement. It's a fun hour every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, we're making sure it lasts an hour, and I'm trying to climb the Shadok stairs during that period of time. I love the, the jokes, I love the information, and I thank them team for doing that. If you're serious about your weight, uh, join our, our weight loss club with us on, on Tuesdays. Um, or, or join Weight Watch, or join your, your group support, but do something. Um, we can all become Jane Fonda's um, and, uh, and, and work at this. So, uh, so the first thing is to get all the chair. So in terms for recommendations for exercise, the American Heart Association recommends at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intense um, aerobic activity. So if you're not sure what moderate means, I took this little um, chart from Harvard Health. And basically in terms of differentiating between the types of exercise, easy if you think about walking, you're taking a leisurely stroll, you don't have any difficulty breathing, you can sing, you can talk, that's considered light. When you move on to moderate, it's kind of like when you're in a rush to get to a place, you're walking a little more briskly, you're walking with a sense of purpose, oh, I'm supposed to get to this location, think about exercises that make you feel that way. So some effort, you're breathing a little more hard, you're not completely out of breath, you can still talk. That's kind of a light to moderate area, and that's something that you can think about including. Then there's a bit more brisk, so you're in a bit of a hurry, breathing a little bit harder again, not completely out of breath, that is like proper moderate exercise. And if you would rather do like more high intensity, then instead of 150 minutes per week, the recommendation is at least 75 minutes per week of vigorous aerobic activity. So that would be like if you're late for an appointment and you ran all the way. So thinking of activities that get you really pump, breathing really, really hard, you're not able to say a sentence, you're really gasping. Those are the kinds of activities that would be fall in that 75 minutes per week category if you would rather do higher intensity than moderate intensity. And beyond just doing those aerobic activities, it's important to do strength training as well. So um, muscle training, muscle strengthening, any form of resistance training, incorporating that into your workout routine is also really important. And it's a point that's often underscored for women, which I will get into in a couple of slides. So for people with heart disease, um, this is a link, it will also be in like the summary sheet that I got from the Heart and Stroke Foundation, that is basically just a manual on how people with heart disease, if they're new to exercising or haven't exercised in a while, can approach exercising. And some of the things they suggest that you consider is how often you're exercising, and the goal should be to try and exercise most days of the week. Obviously, you don't have to start there, especially if you're new to exercising. It might be better to start off small, maybe two days a week, and work your way up to as many days as you can and then intensity so thinking about the intensity of exercise you're doing so when we talked about the recommendations moderate intensity for 150 minutes or vigorous intensity for 75 minutes think about how you structure your workouts and where that intensity comes in and again if you're new starting off easy is a great way to get into that lifestyle change and for how long 150 minutes a week is the recommendation and in terms of type you want to have a good balance of aerobics so like walking, running, anything that gets your heart rate up, resistance, so that's kind of focusing on your muscle strengthening and stretching to flexibility, mobility. And in terms of like how you start, you need to kind of check in with your body and see how it feels. So if you do a particular exercise, you kind of feel easy, you can breathe, you can sing, it was probably a pretty easy exercise and wouldn't necessarily fall in that moderate intensity category. 
if you're talking um, but you're still kind of breathing a bit hard, that's more moderate. And again, if you're gasping, you can't really say any words, that's kind of signals to you that that's a pretty hard activity. Um, again, just some things to keep in mind, especially for people with heart disease. It's not it's not a good sign to have like chest pain that comes on with exertion or if you're getting really lightheaded and dizziness or noticing symptoms coming on with exercise, that's a signal for you to stop because there might be something about the exercise that's triggering your body to experience those symptoms. So keeping that in mind and definitely mentioning that to your doctor, especially if you're noticing that chest pain comes on with exertion is incredibly important. And in terms of starting out with a workout, so these are some of the guidelines that they said, and they're kind of uh, lockdown friendly, so you can make it work even while we have like the stay at home order going on. So if you're just starting out with exercise, and it's like a new lifestyle change for you, the recommendation is start with about two times a week, your first week, maybe you just walk for 10 minutes. Then the next week, again, two times a week, you walk at a slow pace, five minutes at the start, five minutes at the end, and in between, you try to walk at a faster pace for 10 minutes. So you're kind of getting into that moderate intensity zone. And then week three, you're upping it to four times a week. Again, similar layout, you walk to warm up, you walk to cool down, and then you try to walk at a faster pace in between for a little bit longer. And you slowly bump up that time in week four and then weeks five to six, and that kind of gets you in the habit of doing that. Um, with the lockdown, not having access to gyms and not everyone has equipment at home to necessarily feel like they can follow a workout routine, walking is something that we can do inside the house or outside the house, you know, just in your neighborhood during the time that it's safe. So trying and implementing these, especially if you haven't exercised in a really long time or just starting to exercise can get you started on the right tracks. So you're able to make that lifestyle change. And especially when we talk about women tending to be more sedentary and less and more like inactive, this can be a great way to kind of jumpstart that activity. And it has a lot of positive benefits on your cardiovascular health. And for women specifically, anything you can do is absolutely fantastic. If you're starting some form of exercise, that's great. It's going to make a change. There are some like recommendations or tips in terms of ways you structure your exercise. So anything you can do is great, but some things might just work a little bit better than others. So these are a couple of tips. So first is strength training. There's kind of that stigma that for women with strength training, like, oh, you don't want to bulk up. Your goal is to look lean and toned kind of disregard that strength training is incredibly important especially for women who are approaching or who have already passed menopause you're at an increased risk of osteoporosis and part of osteoporosis prevention is strength training it decreases the risk of fractures so trying to incorporate that into your exercise routine alongside aerobic activity or vitamin d and calcium su supplementation as well and in terms of high intensity interval training, when you talk about losing body fat, that's typically what you're told to do because it has a faster cutaneous loss of fat. But the high intensity protocol that's prescribed for men doesn't always work for women. So a couple of things that have been noticed across different studies is that women can do higher repetitions and need less breaks. And they work better with a more like steady state or uh, endurance training than explosivity, which is associated with like the motor cortex of the brain, men and women. So that's not to say that you can't follow the same routine that's been prescribed to a male, but in terms of what might work for you, if you're noticing that you're trying something that isn't exactly working out, these might be things to take into account. So thinking about doing higher repetitions, taking less breaks between the sets that you're doing, or maybe thinking about incorporating more endurance training, more strength training, those might be things that might help kind of get you on the right track and be more effective strategies. And lastly, we wanted to talk about relaxation and meditation. So as I mentioned when I was talking about risks for women, in terms of anxiety and depression, it's something that can pose a greater risk for an adverse event in women. So there's not a lot of concrete evidence on the exact effects of mindfulness practices such as meditation on like cardiac health, but what has been observed is that it can help with stress reduction. And a couple of studies that have indicated that stress management training is an aspect that's kind of missing from the cardiac, cardiac rehab, 
rehabilitation process. So incorporating these sorts of techniques, though there's not a whole bunch of evidence saying that it's going to necessarily have a positive outcome, there's no harm in including it because it can definitely help with stress reduction. And that's kind of an important part of the process when you're talking about lifestyle changes and managing the different diseases and conditions you have. And additionally, for women tending to be more susceptible to like stress-related diseases, stress reduction can have a lot of different benefits for them. So meditation can have long-standing effects on your brain's physiology, and it's been shown to reduce systolic blood pressure. There isn't an exact degree. There's a lot of variance across studies, but it's something that can help. So keeping that in mind, that as part of the lifestyle changes you're making, also taking time to relax and practice being mindful, whether that's through meditation or another type of mindfulness practice, can be really helpful with stress, and stress can have an impact on your overall health. So kind of managing stress is another way to take care of yourself and love your body and keep it healthy. Great. Thanks, Aditi. Uh, and you're not alone when it comes to doing a lot of these. At the clinic, we can really work together towards it. The video that's playing right now, that's actually Dr. Kearney. I filmed him last week while we were, <laughs> we were doing the stairs on Wednesday night. The reason why I was able to film him is because I had to stop and rest at one of the corners while he went up and back. And it looks like he's on the phone. What he's actually doing is zooming into the um, motivation, mindfulness, and movement group that's being done Wednesday. That's 7 p.m. So that's just one of the many groups that we have at the clinic that you can join us on to help work together to some of these goals and reduce your risk of cardiac disease. Uh, something else that we have is a smoking cessation uh, call program with our student Winnie on Tuesdays and Thursdays and the weight loss group that meets Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. And it's all through Zoom, so it's very quarantine friendly. And I just find that they're all just amazing people and working together really motivates me to become better myself. You really would never have caught me at the stairs at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday, but there I was, ready, right there. Uh, there's evidence of it, and I was able to film Dr. Crenio. It was really an inspiration to me to get more fit as well. Well, I, I want to thank just everybody for uh, to make this happen. It takes a, a community, a, uh, a whole bunch of people, and uh, I'm just very grateful to uh, all the, the students at McMaster. They actually have made our clinic and your clinic and your health so much better. Uh, look at from these webinars for, for Stuart behind the scenes right now, Paul before. Um, you're, you're seeing Rachel over here right now. Is I'm so proud of this young lady. Uh, I remember her when she came in as a first year undergraduate student um, and she's matured to just a, a remarkable young lady and she's going to be a fantastic doctor. I hope she'll take me on as a patient one day. Um, and many other students as well, I'd be grateful to. But really, in all sincerity, is that uh, you need to think about how to change your life. And uh, you can notice this plate is that uh, a number of years ago at one of our uh, sessions, uh, I made a bet that I could not be a vegetarian for a month. It's now been a few years later. Um, and um, I'm a pescatarian right now, and I'm probably going to become a full vegetarian at some point in time. Um, but if you're a meat and potatoes person, it's going to be very hard for you to be, to be healthy. Uh, if you don't add activity to your life, you can only do about 1,200 calories for the rest of your life. Good luck. Um, uh, you'll be starving and miserable. Um, what I'm saying is that support of others um, and uh, working together, you can achieve so much. And uh, I'm only as good as the people around me, and they, they make me better, and I hope I can make you better too as well. So um, the team here has done a remarkable job, and, um, and uh, I want to thank you all as, as patients for allowing us to serve you, and we will serve you for as long as we can, um, and we can help in some way. What, I, what I've learned to do is that uh, what I'm trying to learn to do is I'm always in my action phase. I need to cool down the jet sometimes and just listen more. I get it. But I also need you to bring it up a notch or two and take steps to be healthier because um, I, I want to be as active for as long as I can. You know, if all goes well, I'll retire on my 100th birthday here in the clinic with all of you around. Um, I don't know what the future holds right now, but I just think too many people not looking after themselves. We have very good, a lot of good magic uh, when it comes to medicine. We have new technology, which we learned about how to put into play. 
Um, but we have older technology um, that works too as well. We're starting off with uh, fruits and vegetables and running shoes and good, good, good working together into good magic such as and geography, stress testing, echoes, uh, plasmatography, uh, OTN, uh, uh, MR studies, CT scans, and how to put this together is, is a remarkable story, but it all starts with you. Um, what else do you want to say, uh, and Aditi and uh, Rachel? You've done a phenomenal job. You taught me so much. Thank you. Um, we just wanted to point out again that all of these videos are recorded. So, Stuart, if you want to go to the next slide, and just showing everyone where we can find all of them. So, on YouTube, if you search Dr. Kearney, it comes to his profile. Right on the home page, there's a lot of good stuff that we that you can start with. So choosing the right diet for you is weight loss surgery for me, some of these topics. And if you look at the row below that, we actually have a playlist called Popular Live Webinars. If you click on that, it leads us to another list of videos. And there's a lot of different um, variety of topics that you can look at here. So high cholesterol, excessive weight, high blood pressure, plant-based eating, whichever titles jump out at you and that's what you're interested in, please feel free to go ahead and watch them on your own time. You know that sometimes we have a lot of videos and can be difficult to navigate, but uh, for new people who are coming to that YouTube channel, the popular live webinars playlist is a good place to start. And next slide. Just briefly wrapping up everything that we talked about, heart disease is a top killer in women very unique and it can be difficult to diagnose and treat compared to men. So we need to be proactive with the lifestyle changes and prevention and you are not alone is what we want you to remember and take away from this talk. And you can work together with a friend, a family member or a clinic family as well. And on the last slide here, we just have some pictures of women um, around our clinic and in our different areas of life that really inspire us and want us to become better. So the different volunteers, family members, um, previous coordinators, staff, and all the different students that um, really make it a special place. And I think we can end with a final inspirational quote from Jane Fonda herself, if you want to turn on your sound and play the video. Women start off whole. Don't we? I mean, as girls, we're feisty. Yeah, who says? We have agency. We are the subjects of our own lives. But very often, many if not most of us, when we hit puberty, we start worrying about fitting in and being popular. And we, we become the subjects and objects of other people's lives. But now, in our third acts, it may be possible for us to circle back to where we started and know it for the first time. And if we can do that, it will not just be for ourselves. Older women are the largest demographic in the world. If we can go back and redefine ourselves and become whole, this will create a cultural shift in the world. And it will give an example to younger generations so that they can reconceive their own lifespan. Thank you very much. All right, so that's all we have. Um, and just want to thank everyone for all their help today. And the women who are listening in today, it's in your hands to really take control of your health. And it will not only impact you and everyone else around you, but again, um, your granddaughters, your daughters, your nieces, your nephews, they'll all be very inspired by you. And you can be a role model for yourself and everyone else around you as well. Uh, remarkable um, words of wisdom. Um, Stuart, are there any questions or comments out there? Uh, no questions at the moment. And, uh, well, what, what, what's, why don't you give yourself the, what, one of the last words, Stuart? What do you take away from this? Well, I, um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank the, uh, the presenters for putting together a fantastic, fantastic webinar, I think, on a topic that's so relevant but often not discussed nearly enough. Um, I think I learned a, a great deal of information that I was not previously aware of, and I think it's important information for men and women to be aware of this, uh, the amount of research that's available regarding cardiovascular health and, and overall health when it comes to women and how it might differ in some cases. Um, I just wanted to, to also point out that currently there's about 15 uh, viewers overall who are, who are still on, and, and to me that, that signifies that you have patience, you have patience with yourself, you have patience with us, and... I think it also suggests that you're, you yourself are very motivated. So I think with today's webinar, 
there were a lot of uh, key points that were brought up and you can use them as diving boards or as starting points for your journey towards being a healthier you. Uh, we have workshops which we've discussed. We've discussed various guidelines which you can consider. There are many different ways that you can get involved and it doesn't even have to be necessarily with our groups. You can start groups on your own with your friends and your family as well. Of course, making sure that you're staying safe these days. But we just wanted to give you some inspiration, some motivation for how you can take control of your own health. And of course, if you ever have any questions or want to join us on any of our focus groups, you can always email us at drkernu232 at gmail.com and we'll be able to put you in any club that you're interested in. Of course, all of these clubs, uh, we go at your pace. So whether you have experience with exercise, whether you're a fitness guru, or whether you haven't done exercise in years, we go at your pace and everyone is different and we, we recognize that and we honor that. And so we focus on making sure that you reach your goals, whatever those goals might be. I think setting goals are always important, but it's not achieving it's the goals, it's the journey that goes with it. So um, I want to thank uh, Didi and uh, Rachel for really putting this together. Um, as Stuart was saying, we're supposed to try to be at an hour. We had 25 slides. We went up to 70 slides. What else is new? Um, but there's so much good information there. You can fast forward, go back, and look at these things. I look at these pictures here. These are all very important women uh, that are individuals that have made huge contributions to uh, uh, my health and the health of people around me from my uh, my daughter, uh, to my lovely wife, Carrie, to little Jenna, to now big Jenna, uh, and all the, the students around. And, uh, and Jane Fonda is, is, a, is a real big inspiration uh, to, to all of us. So uh, let's make a difference. Let's get a little bit healthier. We'll do it one step at a time. So I bid everybody good night. Um, and speaking one step at a time, tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, we should go upstairs for anybody who wants to come out. And... Uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays at seven o'clock, and then on Wednesday, and then I'm sorry, on Mondays and Fridays uh, at seven at six a.m. We'll have to put a wait to post that because you know if uh, the weather is terrible, probably won't go. But uh, it was there this morning, and the, and the weather was quite good actually. And uh, I get there a little bit late. I'm always there. It's the story of my life. I, I hope to be late for many things, including my funeral. And uh, and right now, there's a lot of things left to do right now to, to make a difference. And I, I thank you all for uh, for listening in. And these are steps for for uh, so that we can all learn from. And, and thank you.